previously, we showed a 3D audio recreation of the Las Vegas shooting. Today, we'll explain sounds produced by gunfire, and clear up some misconceptions. Then we'll answer the question, do the recordings agree with the shooter on the 32nd floor? We'll then raise some issues that still persist. The main point that we need to stress is that for high-powered firearms, there are two independent sounds per shot. One is the muzzle bang, the other one the supersonic crack. They originate in the same place and time, but after that, they exist independently. Here's an analogy, imagine a small powered toy boat. Its engine is running and you're holding it just above the water surface. Then you let the boat drop. Two things happen, one, circular ripples begin to spread out from the point of contact, and, two, as the boat speeds away, it creates its own, V-shaped wake. We now have two independent sets of waves, the circular ripples, and the boat's wake. When you fire a high-powered firearm, you also get two sound sources, which can be made visible using special photography. The first, is the muzzle bang. It spreads out in a sphere from the barrel, regardless where the barrel is pointing. The second is the supersonic crack. It travels with the bullet, which means it depends on its velocity and direction. The V-shaped wake, which travels with the bullet, is made of compressed sound waves. They create a loud crack as they pass by, just like a supersonic airplane. Many people think that a sonic boom occurs in just one instant. This is not true. The wake trails the bullet as long as it stays supersonic. Because the muzzle bang and the supersonic crack are independent sounds, they can overlap in unusual ways, if the shooter is firing automatic. Unlike the muzzle bang, the supersonic crack fades out rather quickly, as it travels more than 100 to 150 feet away from the bullet path. In three dimensions, it creates a cylinder around the bullet path, with a radius of about 100 to 150 feet. This is how this cylinder looks like in the scale of the Las Vegas scene. You can hear the supersonic crack only if you're within this cylinder. Outside this cylinder, you only hear the muzzle bang sounds. If the shooter sweeps his weapon left or right, the bullet path sways rapidly, and so does this cylinder, which changes, or even eliminates the sound of the cracks. This may create the illusion of multiple shooters. If the weapon swings rapidly, it can lead to situations like this one, where at first only the muzzle bang is heard, and then, as the bullet path whips closer, suddenly the supersonic cracks pop up as well. This sound is perfectly consistent with a single shooter swinging the weapon rapidly left and right. For distance measurement the two sounds are very different. The muzzle bang travels a long distance at a constant speed, even though it loses its higher frequencies and becomes a distant thud. Its math is simple, because the time is only tied to the speed of sound. The supersonic crack is different. Its timing depends on two components, the bullet speed, and the speed of sound, as the conical wave moves away from the bullet path. If you know for sure that the bullet has passed within a few feet from you, which of course is not good, and you know the exact bullet velocity, you can calculate the distance to the shooter. In situations like Las Vegas, it's not the case. The bullets are almost never within a few feet of the cell phone location. They're traveling high above, or way to the left or right. As the shooter fires all over the area and the supersonic crack can be heard, all we know is that it's reaching us from somewhere within 100 to 150 feet away. This, without complicated math, tells us little about the distance from the shooter. The math is further compounded, because as a bullet loses its speed over time, the shape of the supersonic cone flattens out, which complicates the calculation. There are professional systems, used by the military and cops, which can process supersonic cracks. But they use high-quality synchronized microphone arrays, and complex math, to backtrack the source. It's not something that can be done by amateurs. On the other hand, muzzle bangs are relatively easy to work with. One more aspect needs to be mentioned. When a bullet passes overhead, the supersonic shockwave hits the ground from above. If the ground is flat and hard, this will generate low amplitude bounce waves, which will mix in with the actual crack sound. This is relevant, because parts of the festival grounds were exposed pavement, while others were astroturf. As the bullets swept over the area, the tone of the crack sounds changed, leading to confusion.
Digital devices like cell phones can press large amounts of video and audio. Depending on the quality of the compression algorithms, this leads to quality loss, in both video and audio. It also affects the audio timing precision. The audio may be out of sync with the video, the actual event, or both. The Consumer Electronics Association recommends that audio sync problems be kept within minus 125 and plus 45 milliseconds. This is on top of any additional sync issues between the video and the actual event. The audio may be out of sync linearly, that is shorter or longer than the video track. Or it may be out of sync variably, that is randomly drift back and forth within the recording. This can get pretty bad with low quality compression, as in this case, where the audio track became shorter than video by half a second during a 22 minute recording. Clearly, cell phone recordings are pretty bad compared to professional gunshot detection systems. Given what we have covered, we can now ask the basic question, do the muzzle bang report times in cell phone recordings match up with the shooter location on the 32nd floor? First, we obtain the precise speed of sound for the relevant weather conditions. Then, using the cab video as a baseline, we calculate the sound travel time for the other cell phone locations for several different volleys, taking into account the respective distances from the 32nd floor. Here are the predicted values. And here are the actual travel times from the recordings. The values are very close for all tested volleys, especially given the fact that the cell phone locations are constantly moving. This is very consistent with the location on the 32nd floor. Here's a graph of the deviations from predicted values. They mostly fall within the CEA sync tolerances, considering that they include not just audio video sync errors, but all other recording versus real time sync problems, and errors introduced by subsequent re encoding on YouTube. The Angel phone seems to be the worst in sync quality, while the Babe is the best. The Angel has other issues, such as a persistent hum throughout. Now a question. Besides the 32nd floor, are there any other locations that would yield the same sound travel times? We can compute such regions in 3D. The result are these hyperbolic curves. Each color represents possible shooter positions for one point in time. They clearly converge on the 32nd floor. Other than the 32nd floor, these locations are refuted by cell phone videos. The location above the roof, by the video shot from the roof lounge, the palm trees in front of the hotel by the cabbie video on her way out. Those commenting on a Las Vegas gunfire often use the word echo. Actually, distant echoes, as opposed to local reverb, play very little role. For a clear echo to exist, there must be a large, mostly flat obstacle, preferably perpendicular to the sound source. Looking out of Mandalay Bay towards the festival, there are no such surfaces nearby, only looking due north. Because of this, only the cab video, due to its location, has some large-scale echoes. There are almost none in the festival area, besides possible ground echoes of the supersonic bangs. Here's a visualization of echoes bouncing off the Mind Freak building and hitting the cab. It's slowed down to make it easy to follow. As mentioned before, cell phone recordings are inaccurate. This makes it hard to determine which round was fired from which window. For the automatic rounds fired during the cab video, sound travel time calculations suggest that the northern window is more likely the origin. Here is a chart of the firing rate for all shooting events. The automatic rounds fall between 8.3 and 11.6 rounds per second. Unfortunately, Bump stocks make the firing rate uneven, which makes weapons hard to identify by firing rate alone. We'll now ask a few questions that remain. The biggest mystery are the 22 muffled shots at the beginning of the cabbie video. They're absent from other recordings, which suggests they're either coming from deep inside the room, or, less likely, some place in the direction of the Delano Tower. Now it sounds like it's coming from um, farther away. How do these shots relate to the encounter with the security guard Asus Campos? 
The latest timeline claims that Campos had engaged the shooter before the massacre started, and that he had been met with 200 rounds of gunfire, with no other exchanges thereafter. So who is Paddock shooting at, five minutes into the massacre? Someone else? Is he laying down suppression fire to pin down anyone in the hallway, even though he doesn't see anyone specific? Or is this the encounter with Campos? If so, Campos is wrong on the timeline. He also exaggerated the bullet count by a factor of 10. Press drawings show Paddock shooting through the broken window, in plain view of everyone, the rifle barrel slightly sticking out of the window. The cabbie video seems to support this. The gunshot sounds are very clear, as if there was a direct line of sight between the barrel and the cab. In the reconstructed 3D scene, we see that Paddock indeed would have seen the cab if he leaned out of the northern window. But this shooting stance can't be true, as the muzzle flash would have been clearly visible. We don't see it in any video. Paddock could have hidden behind the curtains, perhaps leaving a small opening. This would probably damage the curtains and cause all shells to land in the room. But Paddock fired about 1,070 rounds, and we see only 108 shells in the crime scene photos, just about 10%. 960 shells seem to be missing. Are they piled up behind the curtains? Paddock couldn't have easily kicked them out of the window, as the window frame rises an inch or two above the floor. If Paddock's intention was to commit the massacre and then a suicide, why didn't he reinforce or barricade the door? This would give him time if cops were storming the room and he didn't want to be taken alive. Perhaps Paddock had more elaborate plans, but he'd either lost patience, or something forced his hand. The shooter had plenty of ammo left and 23 weapons, so why did he stop shooting? Perhaps the last burst of gunfire provides a clue. It ends in a strange stuttering slowdown. It's possible that Paddock underestimated how much stress his shoulder would take during 10 minutes of bump stock fire, and he simply couldn't shoot anymore. The variation is due to the pressure it takes to operate one of these bump fire stocks, okay? This concludes part two.